And joining me now is Republican Senator James Langford of Oklahoma. He's been taking the lead on finding the short-term congressional fix to the family separation issue. Senator Langford, welcome back to Meet the Press, sir. Thank you. Good to be back with you. Let me start with just a basic question. Have we misnamed this? Is this more of a refugee crisis than an immigration crisis, considering this is a specific area, region of the world where this is emanating from? Yeah, this has been a long-term issue. I'm not sure I'd call it a refugee crisis. Obviously, some would be able to target that, but it's been destabilizing for a long time. This is something the Obama administration saw as well. We started three years ago investing about $650 million into El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala to help provide some economic activity for them, uh, to help provide uh, desta uh, some stabilizing force in their government, and to be able to provide them a reason to be able to stay. I've been in the region multiple times uh, to be able to oversee how that money is being spent, but this is a long-term issue. Uh, you go back to 2013, right. there were about 15,000 families that were coming illegally into the United States as a family unit. Now we're up to 89,000 families a year that are coming at the United States as a family unit. Uh, let's go to some specifics here because we haven't gotten a lot of answers from the Trump administration. Maybe you have gotten some of these answers. Maybe they're fulfilling their duty to at least let you know what's going on in Congress. Do you know how many of these kids that have been separated, uh, how many of them are in shelters, how many of them are in detention facilities, and how many of them are already in foster care? Do you feel like we have a good idea of those three categories? We do. Let, let me clarify this. We know where every single child is. Uh, this is an issue that's, that's gone out there somewhat in some of the other media that's been, not been responsible for this, with the assumption that the administration's lost track of that. Uh, so let me clarify a couple of things. These are career professionals that work with HHS, uh, and that work with DHS and Customs and Border Patrol and ICE. Uh, these are not political appointees. These are career folks. They know where every child is to be able to connect them to their parent or the relative that came. Many of these children that came, we don't know if they're with a parent or not. And so trying to be able to make sure that we're connecting the dots on this. As you know, about of the 12,000 or so children that are out there total, 10,000 of those are unaccompanied minors right. uh, that came with no parent at all. And then you've got another 2,000 that are out there that came with a family member of some type. They're all in HHS custody, and they're trying to be able to reconnect them now. But HHS often puts them in foster care across several states because they can't handle the load on the right. southern border. To be clear, though, while you said we, have, we know where every child is, uh, that the government knows where every child is, the government of the 2,300 that were separated from their parents, uh, that the government has said, we don't, the number might be higher, we don't know, but of the 2,300 they've confirmed, do we know where those parents are? That's, that's an unknown, correct? We don't know where we all do. the parents no, are. No, that, no that, that, that is, well, it's, it's a known of the adult they came with, so the child and the adult that they came with, we don't know if that is the parent. Uh, oftentimes that's a parent that is somewhere in the country, oftentimes illegally as well, that came with another relative and so trying to be able to connect the dots to see if they, we need to connect them with their parent that's already here in the country, connect them with a parent that may right. be in custody, going through procedures, whatever that may be. But and yes, we do not be able to connect the people they came with as well. And how does the reunification work? So you, the, the child, you identify the parent, um, it, it, the child, then what happens? Is the parent brought to where the child is? Is the child brought to where the parent is? Are they both sent to a separate facility? What can you tell us about that situation? Yeah, it, it, it's a mixture of all of those, actually. We're trying to be able to work through the process to connect with the adult. Uh, several of the adults are given some kind of ankle monitoring system, ankle bracelet, uh, so it monitors them until they get to what's called a notice to appear hearing in the days ahead. As you put in your lead-in, which was very well done, the lead-in gave the problem. The Flores Settlement from 1997 right. says that you can only hold that child for 20 days. It takes about 35 days to actually do a hearing. And so what the court set up in 1997 was this conundrum. You either have to release them if they come as a family into the country and hope they show up, or you can't keep them and actually go through a hearing on it. Only two, uh, to be very clear, only 2% of the family units that come to the United States illegally actually go through and actually have the notice to appear, finish up with the notice of removal and actually leave the country. So the family units that are coming here 98% of them end up somewhere in the country, most of them illegally, because they never actually leave after they're given now, the responsibility for an order of removal. Your congressional fix here, let's get into the Flores Amendment here in this 20-day conundrum, because the, the, the Trump administration is asking for relief from, that, from, from the courts. They're probably not going to get it because the Obama administration asked for the ver a very same relief. They didn't get it either. You want to defund it. Um, 
Uh, how does how is that going to make the matter easier to deal with? If you don't fund the the floor is settlement, essentially not allow any congr money to go to it. How is that going to help the situation? I'm a bit confused. So let me let me give you three different options. One is to just say we don't fund it to be able to do a pushback to the court to say we don't we don't give the executive uh, branch the ability to be able to operate this. We want to go back to the court and be able to resolve it. The next tier of it is to be able to change the dates on it to say it's not 20 days. It's maybe 60 days where we can keep families together. That gives enough time to be able to actually get through a hearing. And so we keep families together the entire time to be able to do that. We've got to add additional judges, which we've asked for 225 additional judges uh, across the country to be added for immigration. But ultimately, we've got to deal with floors as a whole. The lowest level, what I'm trying to find is what's the lowest common denominator that's defunding it so we can actually make sure we function together. The best thing that we can do is actually try to reform it and so that we actually keep families together, keep them there long enough uh, that uh, we can actually get through a proper hearing. And are you in favor of using military bases to house these families? It appears that DHS has made a request to the Defense Department. Is that something you think is a good idea? I, I do think that's a good idea because there are locations for that. President Obama used military bases in 2014 for unaccompanied minors. Some of those were in my home state in Oklahoma, which, by the way, members of Congress from my state tried to visit those facilities that are in my state where President Obama was holding his unaccompanied minors. They were turned away at the door and told that they could not come in. The same thing that's happening now. So some people try to say this is something yeah. new the Trump administration is doing, blocking people out. No, it's the exact same policy the HHS had before. We made an appointment. Then after we made an appointment, we're allowed to be able to go in and to go through that process. Should that be the process or should be, there be more transparency here? Do you feel as if the White House has been fully transparent with the American public about what they're trying to do here? I, I don't, actually. And this has been one of the great frustrations. I think the White House has not been clear on how bad the Flores settlement is. They tried to say it and say it and say it. Uh, the challenge is you shouldn't just lo allow anyone to be able to come in at any time to be able to view a spot where there are children uh, present. I think it's entirely reasonable. This has been HHS's policy for a long time to say, if you're going to come into a location where there's children, we need to know right. who you are. We need to know the background. We can't just trust if you show up with an ID that that's who that is. Make an appointment. If you do that, you can get in to get a chance to see him as a member of Congress, just like I did during the time when President Obama had uh, those children here in Oklahoma at a military base as well. Senator, my final question for you is having to do with whether the president is, is creating more problems or if he's making this harder to solve by some of the rhetoric he's using. This is how he's described people coming across the border just this week, Senator. Take a listen. They could be murderers and thieves. They endanger all of our children. Millions of people flowing up and just overtaking the country. They're human traffickers. They're coyotes. I mean, we're getting some real beauties. We want people in our country based on merit, not based on a draw, where other countries put their absolute worst in a bin and they start drawing people. Do you believe that rhetoric demonizes immigrants and makes your job harder? It does, actually, but the, the challenge of it is there is a percentage where the president is absolutely correct on that. But what's the, uh, the percentage? Probably needs I mean, to be we're talking, the, the percentage is pretty small. Um, I it mean, is. It, it is pretty small. So and to do two and that's the two, challenge. I, right. Go ahead. Sorry. I would just say that the, I would prefer the president would step out and say a lot of these are folks that are coming for economic reasons. Uh, they want to be able to flee into an area where they have greater economic opportunities. Every family wants to be able to see that for their family. But there are also some individuals that are there. On average, every day, DHS uh, stops or interdicts 10 people that are on the terror watch list trying to come into the country. And so I have a real concern that we're demonizing law enforcement folks that really are trying to be able to do their job because there are very real threats. But the vast majority of these individuals are coming for economic reasons. That's why they're coming from Central America. They're not fleeing to Costa Rica or Belize or Ecuador, who also have great asylum laws. They're coming to the United States because they want to have the economic opportunities, not just asylum. They're trying to be able to come for economic gains, and I don't blame them for that. But to tell you the truth, okay. 1.1 million people a year become citizens of the United States illegally, and half a million people a day cross legally into the United States from just the southern border. So this can be done legally, uh, but the challenge is for those individuals that is a much smaller number that are doing it illegally, okay. how do you process that? Senator Lankford, I'm going to uh, leave it there. Uh, thanks for coming on, sharing your views. Much appreciated. Thank you. Joining me. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.